Good evening. Welcome to our regular scheduled meeting of the Town Council of Monday, June 19th, 2017. Mike Rell, if you could lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, Just take attendance. Thank you. Councillor Bellow. Here. Councillor Hammond. Wait, not absent. Councillor Hurley. Here. Councillor Latina. Councillor Martino. Here. Councillor Rell. Here. Councillor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor Barry. Here. And Mayor Montaneri. Here. Thank you. Um, our first order of business is uh, Historic Society is uh, going to make a lease payment tonight. <laughs> so we're going to come up and get that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have a few words to say if that's all right. Um, uh, good evening, Amy Woodorf, um, 17 Center Street. I am the Executive Director of Weathersfield Historical Society. Weathersfield Historical Society was founded as a private nonprofit by local residents in 1932. Today, over 85 years later, Weathersfield Historical Society continues to meet the objectives of its founders in our mission to preserve and promote Weathersfield's history and culture to inspire people today and tomorrow. As Weathersfield Historical Society is a community organization founded, funded, and governed by our community members, none of these services would be possible without the support of our members, both their financial support and their gifts of their time and talent. We're proud to partner with the town of Weathersfield to administer four of its historic buildings so that they may be preserved and available to the public. In 2016, the society spent over $175,000, 50% of our total budget, to maintain these buildings and keep them open free of charge to the public. In 2016, the society once again presented over 70 public programs or special events, many of them offered free of charge. We served over 20,000 physical visitors to our sites. Another 50,000 used the resources on our website. Over 2,100 of those visitors to our sites were students for school tours. Most of those students are from Weathersfield Public Schools who visit free of charge thanks to our grant from the Robert Allen Keeney Memorial Fund. Among those student visitors are students in Weathersfield High School's Weathersfield Studies program. Last year, the Historical Society expanded its role beyond providing weekly tours of our sites to partner with the high school and Weathersfield Studies teacher, Cheryl Ryba, to write curriculum and teach in the classroom using primary resource documents and collection objects in addition to site tours to enhance students' understanding of their place in the history of our community. We have successfully implemented several new programs for Weathersfield Studies students and are proud to have them present a history fair at the high school last December. And on view now in the main hall of the Keeney Center are those history fair projects and the students wish you were here postcard project. Please visit the Keeney Center and enjoy the students work perhaps during our free Keeney Coolers concerts coming up next month. This is one of the most important services the society provides for the town the opportunity for our children to learn about the long heritage of our community, all periods of our town's history, and how that heritage affects their lives today and that their accomplishments can affect the lives of those who come after us. We are proud to serve our community schools and proud of the students who learn from our exhibits and programs. I'd like to say thank you, Mayor Montaneri and Councillor Rell, our town council liaison, for all of your support during the year. Weathersfield Historical Society is proud to be partners with the town of Weathersfield in serving our vibrant community and preserving its heritage. We look forward to providing many more enjoyable events and learning opportunities for our community for many years to come. Mayor Montaneri, we have the annual rent payment of one rope of red onions for the Venerable Cove Warehouse, as is our tradition. Thank you. We need a photo op.
thank you for all your work all year, Amy. I know you do a lot for the district, and we're grateful to have you and your staff. Our first order of business is uh, public comment on a public hearing item, a resolution authorizing the issuance of not exceeding 55, uh, 5 .5 million, $5.5 million, rather, refunding bonds for payment in whole or in part of the outstanding principal of any interest or any call premium on the town of Wethersfield's $6.855 million general obligation bonds issue of 2009 and $22 million general obligation bonds issue 2014 and for all costs related thereof. This was posted uh, as a public hearing item and for the first part of our public comment this evening, anybody wishing to speak on this particular resolution which is up for action? Anyone wishing to speak this evening on that resolution? Anyone wishing to speak on that resolution? One more time. Okay. I declare the hearing closed. And we'll move into general comments, public, on any item. Anyone wishing to speak this evening on any item of interest? Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I was uh, not too happy with your vote last meeting regarding mortgaged field, and that is now mortgaged. The fact that we have eternal life programs in this, in this town is pathetic. No matter what happens to that field forever and ever, you will keep spending on it. I was surprised Tony had, uh, Mr. Spinella had uh, introduced that and then he voted against it. While I sat out here, I didn't realize he voted against it. And I give him credit for voting against it. The rest of you get no credit. I think eternal life is what this, this town stands for in all its programs. And another program would be the one that we just saw a few moments ago, the handing over of a rope of onions. The money that we should be putting in our pockets is going in their pockets. And they give you a rope of onions, the most expensive onions probably in the world when you figure what, they, what little they give us in rent for the Standish House, the Kinney Center, and what they rent, take in for rent for whatever. Standish House, I don't know what they take in for rent at the Kinney Center. But they definitely rent rooms. And we go in there and we pay full right for a room. But we gave it to them for $100 a year for 50 years. We're a generous group of people, and we, our council does believe in eternal life for programs, and we saw it last week as well. I, um, I've been attending several meetings. Uh, you know, I, I attend this meeting. I attend the Board of Education meeting. And... Uh, I, uh, well, let me back up for a moment while I'm talking about mortgaged field. I had made a comment, I think Tom had made a comment during the budget, at the very end of the budget process, about the statement that's in here. We want, need, and welcome your input into budget process and how your tax dollars are spent. In big, bold words, letters. But you only care about what certain people want. The rest of them, they can go, you know what. But now that you're going to be stepping up to more eternal life program with Catone Field, I should say Mortgage Field, I had made a comment myself back whenever, not long ago, regarding uh, the mortgage field. And I made my comments, and I can't find it at the moment, but we do have recreation fund, we have youth fund, we have a number of funds in our budget that have a lot of money. And instead of going out and borrowing money, 
We should be using that money. That's what a household would use. If this was a household buying something, instead of going out and getting credit, and they had cash sitting in a bank account, they would use that and leave a little IOU, like the state of Connecticut does. A little IOU. I owe you that. And that's really what you should do. You should deplete your funds that you currently have and forget borrowing. And then let them worry about getting their money back. Just like we did. We got nothing back. One point some million dollars 14 years ago and we got zip. Yes, Polly Moon said. Oh, we gave the town of Wethersfield Board of Ed the town council $17,875 for the field to help them pay for the field. The manager says, no, that was for the consultants. So, you know, Polly's got something mixed up or else the, the manager has something mixed up. But the fact remains, all they had was $17,000, a $17,800 and some dollars to pony up after 14 years. Mayor, you didn't do a single analysis before you voted on Catone Field turf. You, didn't, you have money problems with that, with that field in collecting gate receipts, concession fees, whatever else there should be. You also, what money you do have coming in goes out like a sieve, like the management that we have here. Who cares? And the money just rolls out of that escrow account that they have. And you don't care. The Board of Education doesn't care. And when I read that the Board of Ed was putting in a batting cage, that's a fixed asset. And where are they putting it? They're not putting it in the school building where they're, that's what their responsibility is. They're putting it out in the back, which is the town's responsibility. And, and who's paying for it? The escrow account. Bringing in gravel, bringing in process, bringing in a cement truck, bringing in a number of things. This is the Board of Education who only has responsibility within the, within the building of the school. And you allow this to happen. You don't allow it to happen. You know it's wrong. And you sat up here no more than two, one or two meetings ago, and someone made a comment about that. And you were assured, yeah, town's, town's responsible for the grounds, the school, the BOE is responsible within, within. But secretively, and it is secretive, with the exception of those few who are involved in it, and I'm sure there's several of you, if not most of you, that knew about this all along. Yet, how can, how can you make statements, Mayor? Talk through both sides of your mouth, double tongue, whatever else they want to call it. But the fact remains, you had no business taking their money from that escrow account and spending it on fixed assets at anywhere. And I made a comment over at the board. Why do we even have a budget process? The budget process is a farce. The budget process is to look at the capital, in this case, the capital expenditures that we're planning on working on over the next several years and fitting them in and vetting them, talking about them, and then having you folks vote on it. Thank you, Bob. You did not vet putting in the, the, the baseball cage. You did not vet anything. You just let it happen, and it was wrong. So you really got, you, you, you're getting a credibility problem there. You know? Thank and you I'll much. be back. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Other public comment this evening? No other public comment? Okay, very good. We'll move into council reports. Council reports? Tony? Uh, EDIC met, we got an update on the uh, fun zone property. Uh, it passed uh, planning and zoning on June 6th, uh, 6th. 
subject to some terms and condition. Demolition of the building, we were told, should probably occur sometime in August or September. The vet clinic on the Celestine is moving along well. Uh, they went by today. They're putting up siding and stuff. Uh, Ridge Road Apartments, they're working on the foundations there. Somebody has bought the Carmen Anthony property. And Putnam Park is working on the piers for the deck for their outside restaurant that they hope to open in uh, September. And Lanucci's is open now on the Celestine Highway for business. Uh, the committee is working on their um, Great Elm site project, which is going to interface a bunch of different websites so that people have one place to go to to veer off to to find anything they want to know about the town. And they advise us that the Core Fest is on September 16th. Uh, Budget and Finance Committee met last week and reviewed the uh, refinancing bond plan, which is on tonight's agenda, and a reclassification of an employee that was rejected. And they advise us the tax bills will be going out in July and not waiting because of uh, to keep cash flow uh, going in town. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> Mike? The HDC, <coughs> excuse me, met last Tuesday to go over um, a number of projects uh, in the um, historic district of, uh, of Wethersfield. One of uh, importance to the taxpayers is the replacement roof on the Stillman building, building otherwise known as the Board of Ed building. Um, it is a centuries old building, uh, has an original slate roof that is failing. Uh, there are a number of options out there to replace the um, slate roof either with a uh, synthetic uh, material, uh, asphalt shingles that look like slate, or a like-for-like like, uh, replacement of the slate. Um, in that order is the cost from lowest to highest, like-for-like like being the highest. Um, the Historic Commission, after review of uh, the options, voted to table the measure. That gives them, I believe, two more meetings to decide on what to do. Um, being the liaison for the Historic District Commission, I did talk to them about the options, um, the financial concerns that we as a town and taxpayers have uh, mentioned to, I'm sure, a number of us uh, about the cost of uh, uh, replacement and uh, they are going to weigh their options, look at what is available uh, out there, and uh, hopefully come up with a, um, a choice or determine a choice that uh, is both aesthetically appe appealing as well as cost effective for taxpayers in this town. And that's where we are right now. Their next meeting, I believe, is uh, this Tuesday coming up a week from tomorrow, and they have one more meeting uh, after that to uh, take it up. Thank you, Mike. Council comment? Mike Rowe? Um, I don't know if Amy wants to talk about it. Your daughter was there. But uh, I will defer to <coughs> okay. Amy if you want to talk about the high school graduation. Thank you. Um, high school graduation was Friday evening. Unfortunately, the weather did not cooperate. Uh, so graduation was held at Weathersfield High School, which was actually quite appropriate because this is the class that has seen four years of renovation of the building and they can now finally in, you know, finally enjoy the use of it um, in its completion. So graduation was a wonderful event Friday night and uh, they streamed it live for those who were unable to be in the building. Mike, you want to add? Great. It's unfortunate it was uh, not in the cove. Uh, but uh, it was, as uh, Amy said, at the high school. Um, it was a great night, and um, I wish them all the best. Uh, the best news of the evening, um, aside from everybody being safe and not injured in any um, post-graduation graduation parties, was that this class had a 100% um, graduation rate as well. So it was very good. Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Hurley and I both attended a library uh, strategic planning meeting that the library put on. They had, uh, uh, Mike and I were there, uh, somebody from the board ed and various groups in town asking for input. They're putting together a survey to come up with strategic planning for the future for the library. They will be sending out uh, surveys in the future to people and uh, hopefully people will complete those and send that back to them. 
Next time. Okay. Jeff, you had a couple things you wanted to cover? Yeah, um, if you bear with me, uh, the NBC's here tonight with uh, Derek Greger. We're going to talk a little bit about the Golf Bork project because it's going to be kind of a disruptive thing down on Middleton Avenue. So we're just going to turn on the overhead and give you a map. Bear with us for a second. Uh, Mayor Montaneri, Town Manager Bridges, members of Council, my name is Jason Waterbury. I work for the Metropolitan District Commission. I am the District's Project Manager for the project that we're talking about tonight. Uh, also with me tonight from the MDC is uh, Toby Krantz. He's the Manager of Construction uh, for the uh, Metropolitan District Commission. In front of you on the first slide, actually now in front of you on the first slide, uh, is a brief agenda for tonight. Just give you some more introductions. Uh, I'm going to give a brief summary of what public outreach has been done to date. Uh, on this project and what our plan is going forward. A little background of the project as far as why we're doing the project and what to expect during construction and then just uh, opportunity for any questions you may have. <clears throat> so to date, during the design phase, uh, members of the MDC were here, gave a presentation in town council, I believe it was on May 2nd, 2016. Um, in addition, during the design phase, there was multiple meetings held with uh, town engineers, uh, both Rocky Hill and, and from Weathersfield, uh, and also from DOT. Uh, any comments that were received, we incorporated into uh, the plans. And then um, moving forward, uh, the project was bid uh, in June of 2016. We had an extended bid review period, and we awarded the project at the end of 2016, early 2017. Um, and I'll go through the schedule of construction in another slide. Um, going forward, we, have, we had a public outreach meeting. Um, roughly four or five members of the public came, although uh, I don't remember the exact count of numbers, that, that number of public that was invited, but it was the entire stretch of Middletown Avenue, uh, all the side streets impacted, uh, Mill Street, uh, Hewitt and Maple, and a couple other streets up in that area too. Um, and then we had a pre-blast meeting because there's going to be blasting for rock removal on this project. That was held on June 1st, administered by the Fire Marshal uh, Dignati. Uh, so the reason we're doing this project is to eliminate sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, sanitary sewer overflows really come in two primary shapes and forms. One is the pictures on the right-hand side of your screen, which is where you actually have a pipe, a uh, physical pipe or outlet, where sewage, when it's too much uh, sewage in the, in the sewer, will actually outlet to a water body. In this case, it's Gough Brook. Um, or on the left-hand side, where the, there's too much uh, wastewater in the sewer itself, and that actually comes up and bubbles up through the manholes. Um, in this particular project area, you're probably familiar with that happening along the Silestine Highway and on Hewitt Street. It's a chronic problem. The district's obviously aware of it. Um, done numerous projects to get, get us to that point uh, where that can be eliminated. So the project area itself is the uh, red line that kind of goes through the middle of your screen. So just to orient it, uh, the, the horizontal leg uh, moving east-west at the top, that's Mill Street. Basically halfway between that um, um, is uh, the Silestine Highway going north-south. So the upstream end is actually the intersection of Maple and Hewitt, 
which is that little dog leg. I apologize for not having a laser pointer. Apparently it wasn't working. Um, and then the downstream end is actually the Rock Hill Water Pollution Control Facility, which is that yellow box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, so the reason we're doing this project is to eliminate the sanitary sewer overflows, like I mentioned on the prior slide. If you look at I-91 cutting kind of horizontally through the screen, um, right where right where I-91 I cuts through um, over Silas Bean Highway, or Route 99 actually at that point, is the Gulf Brook Sanitary Sewer Overflow. So that's where the outlet is that goes to Gulf Brook, eventually the Connecticut River. So we're, to close that overflow and also to eliminate the overflows in Silas Bean Highway, uh, it had three main pieces. One was the upgrades to the Rock Hill Treatment Plant, which are ongoing now, um, expected to finish in middle of 2018. We have this project, which is the uh, basically it increases the capacity of the collection system to match the capacity of the new newly upgraded Rock Hill treatment plant. And then you had um, removal of excess flows uh, to the best we could, which is the lining projects you've probably seen going on in town going back to 2008 and even to present now, where we lined a good chunk of sewers. The project itself, <coughs> it's about 5,200 feet of new sewer. Um, it is truly a relief sewer, so it does not impact any local connections. Um, it will take excess flows from that upstream end, the intersection of Maple and Hewitt, and then bypass the other parts of the collection system, go directly to the treatment plant. Um, it's about a 28 to $29 million construction project, so it is a pretty complex project with, with regards to sewer projects in the district. Um, total contract time is 640 calendar days. So what that means is with, uh, we're, we issued our notice to proceed to our contractor on April 13th. Uh, that e equates to a construction completion date of September 2019. And that's including two winter shutdowns. Um, the district's policy has been that we do not allow contractors to do street work between the dates of December 1st and March 31st due to safety concerns, pavement management, and whatnot. Um, however, this project's a little unique um, because of uh, the tunneling aspects, which I'll get to. Um, the contractor has already approached us um, that he would like to work during the winter, so he's in the process of working up what that schedule would look like. So the dates I have in here are estimated. They're a little conservative from our construction <coughs> manager. Um, but we, once we do have a finalized schedule working with either uh, Derek and Town Manager Bridges, we can provide another update. So the project itself, it has, like I said, has about 5,200 feet of new sewer, uh, both open cut, which, you're, which I'll show pictures of. It's your traditional excavator digging in a hole, putting a pipe in the ground, and then tunneling work, uh, where it's actually digging down to uh, a set elevation and then drilling from that point to another open pit uh, to install a pipe. In addition, this project does include some minor modifications to the treatment plant, um, and then also restoration at the end. Again, the September 2019 date, that's 640 days from April, April 13th. Uh, if the contractor does work through the winter with, a, with the approval of the district, the town, and DOT, if it's on the DOT road, um, that date is subject to change. It would actually move up. It, it, could, it would move to an earlier date. Um, one other item that could impact the schedule is you know, the, the DOT itself. Uh, due to issues unrelated to this project, DOT isn't, um, hasn't yet approved our contractor's construction permits. So this picture... Uh, kind of shows where some of the tunneling work is and where the open cut work is. On the screen, the magenta pieces are the tunneling pieces. And you can kind of see blue dots. Those are the envisioned pits when the project was designed. Um, the blue legs in between are the open cut pieces. Now, it may look like a little mix match, but it, it's the tunneling work was selected based on the geotechnical conditions. We are tunneling through rock. So where the rock wasn't hot, um, shallow enough, then it's open cut. When the rock was shallow enough, we're, tr we're drilling through the rock. Um, the only exception to that rule is the piece underneath I-91 where we're doing an auger bore or tunneling uh, because it's, you can't excavate that sewer underneath the deck of I-91. So just some pictures. A lot of these are actually were slides that I had also given at the May 11th meeting, uh, but I figured that they were appropriate for tonight also. Um, the pictures on this first pro slide right now are open cut pictures from what was the original, the, the predecessor to this project, which was a, an extension of a trunk sewer on Meadowgate, Griswold, and Fairland Drive. That happened about six or seven years ago. Uh, similar length, um, similar conditions. Uh, it, what that did is also provide extra capacity to that neighborhood to eliminate basement backups and sanitary sewer overflows that had been happening in that area, the, the collection system. 
Uh, now for the tunneling work. The top left picture, that's a picture of a micro-tunneling machine. Um, that's not necessarily a machine on this project, but it's a representative, what we would expect um, type for, for this project. And then the bottom left and the bottom right, those are example pictures of uh, pits. So basically when the contractor needs to tunnel uh, the sewer, what he has to do is excavate down to the top of the rock and then remove the rock either by mechanical or blasting methods, um, support the excavation, make it safe and, um, and secure. Then at that point in time, they'll start lowering in the tunneling equipment and the pipe. And that's what the picture on the right hand side shows is a crane lowering the pipe down to the ground. Now there's a better picture on the next slide. Um, the left hand picture is that same pit that was on the left hand slide that was basically it's the same pit on the left hand bottom here it's just a close up um, and you can kind of see up at the top of the hill there's some cones in the distance that's the next pit where he's drilling to so in lieu of digging that entire stretch that that is tunneled so you have you are in a single location for an extended period of time because you have to dig down remove rock get everything secure but you're also not disturbing the entire roadway as you move up the road so that's the advantages to tunneling and then the picture on the right, that just shows what the inside of a pit looks like with the shoring and supports and whatnot, and usually has a um, kind of a rail or railroad kind of system where they, where they bring the tunnel equipment in, they'll bring the pipe in, and so what you see in that picture is actually a tunnel, one of the pieces of the tunnel machine being loaded into the hole. So when the project is all said and done, um, the plan is to do mill and overland some roads, trench repaving on others, uh, there are some stretches of pipe where we're outside the public right away or on private easements where we're going to have to reseed lawns and whatnot. Uh, there's no private property work planned, so you don't have any, you know, like, like that was one of the reasons I mentioned we're, we're not doing any sewer laterals or water services or anything like that as part of this project. So you, you don't have any private disturbance. And then in certain areas where we are, are off the road, we will have to repave, replace sidewalks where they are disturbed. Um, with respect to the milling and overlay, the plan which matches the town's pavement management policy, which we work with Derek on, is to mill and overlay uh, Hewitt, Mill Street west of Salestine Highway, a uh, small portion of Mill Street east of Salestine Highway, and then portions of Middletown Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, as part of the Clean Water Project, the district's uh, the district has established policies and procedures for keeping other agencies in the loop, shall we say, with what we're doing and how to you know, make sure that we don't surprise people when we show up. Um, we're very familiar with working with DOT and Connecticut Transit. Um, we've got people that have contacts in those both those organizations. Uh, we've already met with the fire marshal on this project, obviously, and we've also had um, we, our plans, I believe, were sent to the police department too, and we got comments back from them. We'll be, probably we'll be meeting with them again, the same thing with Rocky Hill. Um, to make sure you know we don't disturb any emergency service routes or whatnot, and then the school the school transportation is a little tricky because obviously bus stops can change from year to year. Um, we do have the bus routes for this year. There would be stops in our area, but we're waiting really for next year's bus stops to be established before we contact Board of Ed and work with Board of Ed as far as whether or not a bus stop can be relocated or if it's a special needs bus stop that we have to accommodate. And that's we have people that have worked with that before within the district, so it's nothing that we, not a challenge we can't overcome. <clears throat> now, the next couple slides are the permanent work zones or, or extended period work zones where what to expect. Um, I'll go through them in detail, but if you, have, if you want to copy this presentation and kind of show them and look, kind of look at them and study them a little bit more and think about it, I can also provide that. So the first slide is alternating one way and also uh, one section of road widening where we're doing two-lane road. The southern stretch, which is where we're tunneling underneath I-91, that is going to be an alternating one way, and that's we're expecting to be in place from July of 17 to December of 17. And when we have these alternating one way sit, uh, patterns, we're going to have um, temporary traffic signals that would be brought in, so that way the traffic can be controlled from through the work zone and also into the work zone if there's any driveways that are impacted within that 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 footprint. The middle two areas, which are Mayfield and Casey. The Casey Lane area, we're actually going to widen the road and take two lanes around it. So the, the pattern will just it will maintain two lanes, but it will be going around our work zone. The stretch at Mayfield, uh, we are going to allow alternating one way through that stretch. And that would be about of October of 17 to June of 18 is what we're estimating. 
and then the Mill Street piece, which is really from the railroad to Middletown Avenue, that's August of 17 and May of 18. Now that, that Middletown Mill Street section will show up again because that, that is a pit where we're actually launching in two directions. We're launching towards Mill Street and launching down Middletown Avenue. So that, that location we're gonna be in for a while. Um, the remaining piece of Mill Street west of the railroad um, is open cut and we don't know what that schedule is yet. That's really subject to what the contractor can work out with his proposed um, winter work. Now, uh, the location in the Middletown Mill Street intersection, that's one of the pieces we're going to be at the longest time. That's September 17 to June of 18. In that situation, Middletown Avenue between Maple and Mill Street will be closed to, except for local traffic only. Um, through traffic would be detour to Mill, um, Silas Dean, and also on Route 3. Then when you go on Mill Street West, I might have skipped a slide here. Nope. Mill Street West, this is the, um, actually, let me skip that. Then you have the Silas Dean Highway Crossing, where we're expecting to be there in November of 17. Uh, that's based on the contractor's schedule. We're doing it in three phases, which are the three pieces that you see in the middle of your screen here. Um, it's going to be all night work per DOT, so it won't be during the day, and it would be restored to full traffic at the end of each work day. And then what this does impact is a little bit of Mill Street west of Silas Dean Highway, uh, where eastbound traffic would be detoured. Actually, also Mill Street east of Silas Dean Highway, eastbound traffic, where, I'm sorry, eastbound traffic would remain open, westbound traffic would, re would be detoured. And that detour would either be Middletown Avenue or Maple Street, depending on um, where we are. Then you move west on Mill Street, and you have the open cut piece, which is the piece that where that is between Signal View and Silas Dean. That would, we're expecting to be done in November of 17. And then the tunneling piece, which is uh, from Mil U Maple Street to Signal View, would be April of 18 to August of 18. And what that also impacts is Signal View itself, where Signal View northbound will be open, but Signal View southbound, which is really from the plaza into um, Mill Street, will be closed. Uh, we're aware of that it will impact the tenants in the plaza, so once we have a, a more detailed schedule worked out here, we are going to meet with the tenants themselves to make sure that they're aware of this plan and uh, that they can let their prospective um, uh, customers know that they're going to have to use Salestine as the entrance. Um, and then when you go move along to Maple and Hewitt, uh, the intersection of Hewitt and Maple are going to be there, we think, in August of 19, uh, although I think that date can come up if the winter work uh, does go through. And then the off-road piece, which is um, north of Maple, doesn't have any traffic impacts, but that's June 19 to September 19. And one of the key parts with that is that is one of two locations on this project where we're actually physically crossing Gough Brook. And, um, because of the wetland issues and, and to, to comply with the requirements for our wetland permit, that can only be done between the dates of June and October. So we could be ahead of schedule for everything else, but then wait and come back and cross Golf Brook there, depending on how everything, all the se everything sequences out. Now, as far as example notifications um, for the residents, the next few slides I, I did steal from that first presentation. Um, I don't expect we would have any more meetings with the residents. It would only be if there was really something that drastically changed in the plan. But in general, we do send out information of flyers on a project like this every one to two months or in advance of any major traffic pattern. So, you know, the first time we set up in Middletown and Mill, even if it hasn't, if it's only been a couple weeks since we sent out a notice, we'd say, uh, by the way, this is, we're approaching Middletown and Mill. We're going to be here for, you know, from this date to another date. And then additionally, I did hand out um, the flyer that was given out at the last meeting that has my contact information and also our field engineer, or resident engineer, John Malone. Uh, he'll be in the field every single day. Um, and then also for residents, if they can't get a hold of one of us, there's our command center, which is extension 3600, which will track someone down at the MDC. Uh, and with that, I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Yes. How long was it going to take you to get across to Salestine? Uh That was forecast in November. I, I would think it's going to be about a month. A month? Okay. I, I think. Because you're looking at shorter work hours. they got to plate it at the end of every single day. 
So it's going to it's, it's not going to be a very productive exercise, and that unfortunately could not be tunneled because of the geotechnical conditions. Thanks. Yeah. I might have the same question you have. Um, if we have potential development happening on the Silestine, how will that be affected by all this? It, from a sewer perspective, um, you're talking about the Silestine and Mill, the, the, the potential plaza. Is that what this is? Probably the plaza. As far as, I don't know if you're referring to development in the future, this will add capacity to the system because of the fact that they're bypassing flow around the existing system, which will open up more capacity in the system for future connections. Um, specifically, we have the fund zone property development that's coming in, and they've been in touch with MDC. We've put them in touch with each other. Um, they've come to MDC for approvals, and we've spoken to MDC who has said that they will be able to provide water and sewer service for that development. Um, it will be where they connect, whether they connect in Silas Dean Highway or Mill Street is still dependent on the, the project schedule for MDC and the development schedule, but they're still working on those things. So as far as uh, sewer capacities, yes, that, that can all be provided with what they're doing. As far as just construction coordination, um, they are still finalizing their schedules to kind of figure out. We, they have been in touch with each other about how, we, how they need to coordinate to make sure that um, you know, there's access in and out of the property as that development is primarily accessing off of Mill Street. Thank you. So the area west of Mill Street, uh, yes. west of Silestine Highway on, on Mill Street, yes. heading towards Maple. Yep. When you're doing that work, are the, is there going to be a sidewalk open? Because there's a development nearby that there needs to be access to. Any, to side, any sidewalk that we close, we provide a temporary crossing and make sure you can get to a sidewalk on the other side. So we, there are, I don't, I have, I'd have to look at the plans to see that specific location, but we do have areas where we put in temporary sidewalks and temporary sidewalk okay. crossings. There's sidewalks on both sides of okay. the streets. So then we would, what we would do is provide another crossing at, you know, probably Maple Hewitt and then Silas Dean to make sure they can get around safely. And we would put up signs that said sidewalk closed ahead. Okay. Um, and then the other thing was uh, um, the winter work. Yes. Is there a cost effect, either positive or negative, about allowing that winter work? Um, I would, we haven't run that analysis yet because we don't know exactly what work is proposed for when. Um, that's part of the schedule submission. They have to tell us what location. If it's just the tunneling work itself and just digging pits, it would not be a cost increase. It would be a cost decrease, if anything, or a net because you would be looking at a shorter overall construction period. Um, I, I doubt it would, I'm trying to think of how it would actually increase the work, the, the cost, but I, I can't, I don't think it would. Okay. Um, and this will not impact water or sewer uh, services for the existing customers? Correct, correct. And then on um, Mill Street between Middletown Avenue and the Silestine Highway, yep. that portion will be closed? Uh, eastbound would be open, westbound would be closed. So there would still be access for the uh, businesses in that stretch and Ye the apartments? Yes, and actually the, the, the business, that plaza on the corner of Silas Dean and Mill where Walgreens, I think it's Walgreens and Pet Supplies Plus are, mm -hmm. he, the owner of that plaza was one of the people that actually came to our meeting on May 11th. Um, and his main concern is actually deliveries. Um, he's not as concerned with um, customers coming in because you have the Silas Dean entrance also, but it's really deliveries because the deliveries come off a mill and we're not going to be blocking his driveway. So we've already worked that out with the contractor and him where deliveries will not be an issue. And the condos as well? The condos, we would not be blocking any driveway to the condos. Uh, if you have a momentarily time where there's a piece of equipment in front of the way, that's always subject to happen, but we, that's why we have field staff there. Um, we, Next, you know, an excavator can be moved, a, a trench box can be moved, but we would not be permanently blocking anything. Okay, and I have one other question, um, Jeff. There's a, a motion for for um, funding from, I think, the CROG or the state. In, isn't that in the same area? You want to talk about that? How does that in, how does that play out with this MDC project? Yeah, I was going to speak to that later. We, we do uh, have, have, no, that's a, that's a good question. At the south end of Middletown Avenue, there is a, um, there is local road accident reduction grant funding. Uh, we had looked at a project last year. We were going to, we were going to look at it, uh, putting it in again. It does overlap with MDC's project. Um, right now, they are finalizing their sewer alignment through that area. 
once they've done that, then we're going to, we've been in discussions with them about what level of work they need to do in that area compared to what we need to do from a safety improvements perspective. So some of that work will be done by MDC. Some of it will be funded by the town, and we're still working out those details with MDC right now. Thanks, Amy. Mike, bro. Thanks, Jason. Um, quick question. It might have been up there. How many of the pits would you um, be boring, um, the vertical shaft pits? Yep. Total or at one time? Well, okay. I guess it would be you'd be doing it in stages. Typically, you have at least three pits open at, one, at once. At one time. Okay. Um, the other thing, this where it gets into the contractor, our con our contractor is Baltazar, Baltazar Construction. They're a general contractor. They excavate, they dig, they put in pipe. They would be the ones digging the pits. They bring in a tunneling specialist to do the tunneling work themselves. So what they want to do is make sure they have enough work staged for that tunneling contractor so the tunneling contractor isn't waiting. And that's why you usually have at least three pits open. So while the tunneling contractor is drilling in one direction, they'd be hopping over, the Baltazar would be hopping over it and digging the next pit. Mm -hmm. So those, uh, purple this, circles would be locations of the pits. Yes, those would be the pits on there. Um, there's a couple locations where the contractor has proposed to us possibly um, drilling through the pit and then digging down and installing a shaft, and that is less intrusive, but we haven't fully evaluated that yet. That's part of the construction submittal process that we're going through right now. And they would be in roads, not on uh, town property, just the snow shelves or... Um, private. Their entire stretch of Middletown Avenue is in the road itself uh, until you get just south of I-91 and then it goes cross country to the treatment plant through easements that we're in the process of, in the process or actually have uh, obtained. And then Mill Street is completely within the road um, all the way up to Hewitt. Once you get up to, I'm sorry, all the way up to Maple. Once you get up to Maple, there's a manhole that is slightly off the road in the public right of way, but in the snow shelf, and then again on the other side of Maple. And that's for two reasons one, for traffic reasons, but two, when we cross Golf Brook on Maple itself, we, because of the DOT footbridge there, we had to be off the road. So in that stretch, we were, we've gotten easements from the dental office and then also cerebral palsy. And um, there's a proposed easement at which our, I believe, legal counsel is working on uh, from the town itself. Just to add to that, um, Jason is referring to where the sewer is going to be, you know, post-construction. During construction, there is going to be work zones, barricades set up that will, and will be within the right-of-way outside the road limits. So there are areas along Middletown Avenue where the right-of-way is set back uh, 15 feet maybe from the road. That work zone may go right up to the property line. Um, there's areas where we have road closures where it will be right-of-way to right-of-way. So the work will extend beyond that, but it will all be restored, you know. Part of the All project. property owners would be notified or have been notified. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. We've actually already met with a couple property owners. There was a couple property owners that could not attend the public meeting that have already contacted me and I've met with on this project. So, um, it, word of mouth, they, they they tend to start to learn. Mm -hmm. Understood. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. All Thank, right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. My name is Director Mike O'Neill's here. We're going to talk a little bit about the tax bills and the motor vehicle taxes that uh, we're going to kind of forego for now because we don't have a good mill rate for those. So, Michael. Good evening, Mike O'Neill, Finance Director. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as you know, the state's failure to adopt a budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1st has been a topic of discussion during our budget adoption um, process and uh, amongst finance directors, town managers, and others um, for the last several months. Um, things are very much up in the air in terms of really two things, the amount of state aid that we might expect and what uh, will happen with the statute that currently caps motor vehicle 
uh, the motor vehicle mill rate at 32 mills down from 37 um, in the present fiscal year. <clears throat> we have decided, uh, we've talked to other towns, other, uh, our tax collectors talked to other uh, tax collectors, and we've decided that um, the appropriate course of action will be to print and mail the real estate and personal property bills as we do every year. So those will be going out um, by the end of next week and to hold off. Typically what we do with a motor vehicle is everything is billed, the bills go out at the end of June, the full amount is due. There's no split between um, July and January. Um, so what we'll do instead is wait uh, see what the, see what the state does, and then mail those bills out at the end of December to be collected in January. Just in terms of the the breakdown in the number of bills and what that means in terms of dollars that we would not be collecting right now, um, the total levy is about eighty five million dollars. Eighty million of that is real estate and personal property. That's split half and half, so we collect about 40, we would collect about $40 million um, in July and the other $40 million in January. The remaining piece, the $5 million, five, about $5.8 million, is motor vehicle. That's the piece that we would typically collect in July that instead we're going to wait until January. And what that means is we'll, we'll essentially have to float that amount to the extent there is needs for that cash from reserves. We have $12 million of fund balance, um, so that that's, doesn't present a problem for the town from a cash flow perspective. In terms of the number of bills and just kind of why we think this makes sense, there are almost 40,000 40, bills in total that get sent out um, every year. 23,000 of those our motor vehicle. So almost two thirds, more than half are motor vehicle. There are a lot of work. Um, if we sent them out now and the state changed the motor vehicle uh, mill rate cap, we'd have to send out an adjusted bill, essentially doubling the work on that portion of the bills. So again, for the cost of essentially having to float the cash flow on $5.8 million, until halfway through the fiscal year, um, we just think it makes sense to uh, to handle things that way. That's what we're proposing. Um, that's kind of where we we're working towards. You want to bring this to the council, make sure that you are comfortable with this. <coughs> um, the process of sending out a second bill, we'll probably have to send out a second real estate bill anyway, but doubling up on the motor vehicle bills, that would create just just a lot of work. So getting those right just one time is probably more effective than trying to collect that five million now and then rebilling. I think there's gonna be a considerable amount of confusion with an adjusted real estate bill if that happens to begin with and then throwing the motor vehicle on top of that would just get, um, would cause even more disorder at this point. So we uh, intend to bring this to your attention and kind of lay out the plan we have right now. <clears throat> yeah. Um, this isn't what we discussed in budget and finance, is it? Didn't we just discuss, I thought all the bills were going out at once, no? Did this change since budget and finance? This is a change. Okay. Um, we talked about it, but we just looked checking. at <laughs> the scale of the no number of motor vehicle bills at over 20,000, mm -hmm. and doing those twice um, would be kind of onerous. Sure. Yeah. Um, why not send them out like August 1st or September 1st once the state's budget has been finalized? Why, what's the thought process in waiting until January? January is just half the year. If we do get a budget and it's earlier, the council can make the determination and instruct staff to send them out whenever it's available as a mill rate. And how are you going to um, how are you going to get this word out to the public? Because this will be, I'm sure the tax office will be inundated with phone calls and yes. questions, where's my car tax bill? I have a press release that I'll send to Kathleen McWilliams this evening. Mark DiPaolo is here tonight. We'll put it on the website, and I've uh, put the tax collector's phone number on the press release, so. <laughs> 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 she can, no, but that is gonna be a problem. Uh, people have expectations sure. this time of year um, on all their bills, and we have people that are very 
um, deliberate in their tax paying regimen every year. They expect to do it. They want to do it. They come in specifically to pay their bills. Um, so it will cause some disruption. Um, and we'll just have to work through it. I think every town that has a mill rate above 32 is looking at the exact same situation. And do you have a mechanism for people who prepay taxes? We don't prepay taxes. That's, we don't pre So if somebody did try to, there is no mechanism in place for someone who did want to pay no. for part of a ta car tax or something No, like we that. don't, we don't collect that. We don't have a, you know, that's got two and a half people in that office, so managing prepaid accounts isn't within their capability. Does it have to be at the end of the, the month or the beginning of the month? And the only reason I'm asking, um, you know, if you, if you send them out December 15th, people would have the option for tax purposes to, to yeah, it's just it's 30 days. Calendar year. So yeah, in case. we have, we have flexibility. Yeah. And I, and I you take away that choice if you do it at the right. January one. And, th and that's going to be an issue for a lot of people. They like to take that deduction right. in their in their taxes. So if we do have the capability to send them out before the end of the calendar year, that would be something that allows that mechanism to continue. We'll have to take a look at that. Okay. Yep. Particularly if we're sending out a revised real estate bill, probably want to send those all out together. Yeah. Yeah. There's really no. There's good, no good there's scenario. No good. I mean, we have, like I said, I mean, we've consumed <laughs> countless hours. It feels like kind of running through different scenarios, and it just everything other than just the 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 usual process that we always have has has some disadvantage. You know, and it's the potential for confusion or disruption of you know the way people prefer to do things. Mm -hmm. Like you were. To Amy's point, if people prepaid their taxes, they'd be paying at a statutorily required 32 mil, correct? I mean, we're assuming the governor's, what is current law would go into effect? Well, I think the, 32 whole, mil. the whole idea about holding on the motor vehicle is that we don't really know what they're going to do. And we don't allow people to prepay anyway. Right. So, I mean, if, the only prepay if you will would be if we mailed a bill on june 28th and someone came in on the 29th right you know but there in that case you've got a bill yeah you know in right. this case there's no motor vehicle bill there wouldn't be a bill so someone couldn't you know they, i suppose they could find their assessed value of their car and yeah. multiply it by the, the you know the 32 mils but there's no there's no build amount for that so piece those of property. who paid property tax on their motor vehicles last year paid it on 37 mills mm -hmm. last yes. July 1st this year we're anticipating 32 mil well it's the current it's the right. current law the current law and then we do not know what it could go up to correct I they, mean there's talk of taking the lid off altogether right which would then equalize with the real estate 40 or 39 and change well, you would think yeah. that it would go down somewhat because. <clears throat> oh yeah. Yep. So. Greater than thirty-seven, but less than. Thirty. Less than what we adopted at. Right. right. Thirty-nine seven four. Okay, so for the those out there listening, possible end of December bill could be as low as thirty-two and as high as thirty-eight and change. Thirty-nine and change. Thirty-nine and change. Right. Okay. But I think it's a good point. As soon as we know, adjust and, and get them out so people can take advantage. Even on the real estate, that's, that want, that's a bigger number, probably. Yeah. People, you know, I know I want mine paid by the end of the year mm -hmm. to take that deduction. So, If that deduction is still available uh, after budget negotiations in Hartford. When does the supplemental bill go out? When does the supplemental bill go out? When do you supplement? October. October. Jody? So just to clarify, this fiscal year, one property tax bill or two? If you're sending the regular property tax bill out in July, do you, so do you split? And I'm sorry that this might seem like a silly question. So we're July just talking about, January, talking about real, real estate? Just real estate. Right. One bill, two payments. 
July payment and a January payment. And then for car, we're going to wait, but it would be end of December, possibly. As late as the end of December. With one payment or two? One. So motor vehicle is, has always been one payment with a bill mailed at the end of June. And then as far as supplemental is concerned, how would you be able to send a supplemental if you haven't even sent the first, or are you just talking for property? Supplemental bills are people that bring cars on after the original grand list item. Okay. Um, we, will, there... we will not send any bills without a mill rate. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be who of us. Um, and then just a thought. Uh, to <clears throat> I know the state statute that currently stands for purposes of uh, motor vehicle or even property tax says that if you are not compliant with that state statute that your municipality could face a 10% reduction in state aid. And I know in the municipality that I worked in, we sent a letter to OPM asking for the waiver um, just to kind of cover the bases. And I thought maybe that might be a good idea for us to do. To yeah. waive what? Um, that you would not be penalized if you don't send out your motor vehicle bill by the statute date that you would not be penalized by a 10% reduction in state aid. I don't know. I think if that's if if it's the same statutory requirement that I'm thinking of, it's a request that cannot be made until July 1st. I know that we've we've there's no statute that requires a tax bill to go out. But it says if you send one out, you got to give them 30 days to pay it. There's a July 1 date. I'll pull the number for you. It's only the secretary that can offer the waiver. I didn't. I know some other municipalities, Westport, for instance, did the same. I know that the tax collector has looked at there were there was a requirement along those lines that she uh, had done research on a, a month or so ago, and like I said, we just sort of had a lot of discussions. But you know, we'll make sure the tax collectors all talk, and oh so yeah, we. Uh, We'll make sure we're in compliance. Sure. That's all we had. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Wow. Yep. Anything from Dolores in her absence? Yeah, we've just been busy with the dogs. We're up to about 800. Our dogs. <laughs> Very good. All right, we'll move on to council action. Uh, 1A, I believe there's one resignation. Uh, Councilor Hurley. Here, Mike. Oh, was that? No, it was in there. Okay. Insurance Committee, Robert Cobb, 99 Meadowview Road. Um, a resignation. He was up from 7114 to 63019. Second. Motion and a second. Questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. There are no appointments. Um, we'll move on to the uh, resolution. One seat. Motion to approve the resolution authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $5,500,000, refunding bonds for payment in whole or in part of the outstanding principal of and interest and any call premium on the town of Wethersfield, $6,855,000. Dollar general obligation bonds issued in 2009 and $22 million general obligation bonds issues of 2014 and for costs related thereto. Second. We have a motion and second. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, it's Mike O'Neill from the uh, Finance Department. Come on up and talk to you about this one too. Um, opportunity <coughs> to save some dollars as we talked about during the budget process through the refunding of some already issued debt. <clears throat> Good evening, Mike O'Neill, Finance Director, again. Um, this item would authorize the town manager to issue up to $5.5 million worth of bonds strictly for the purpose of retiring uh, bonds that are outstanding from the 2009 bond sale and the 2014 bond sale. Um, we were, this, uh, Opportunity was brought to our attention by our financial advisor, PFM. Um, we are looking at uh, saving as much, depending on market conditions, saving as much as $350,000 uh, 
on a net present value basis, which means today's dollars, it's 350,000. It's more dollars out in the future. The savings would be spread over several years. Um, as the town manager mentioned, the adopted budget, town budget for fiscal 18 includes uh, savings of $40,000 from this initiative. Um, what we've seen, and again, there's a, a, a little bit of latitude in how the refunding would be structured, but typical, you know, best practice is to spread that out. Um, and doing that, we're looking at um, as much as $80,000 of savings in fiscal 18. Thank you. Questions for Mike on this? Jody. Is it a th uh, 20 or 30 year? These would be 12 year bonds because you can only, the new bonds can't mature beyond the point of the bonds that are being retired. Mm -hmm. So those are, those in there, so they're particular maturities. There's, there's different interest rates when you sell bonds and the different years where the principal payments occur. Mm -hmm. So they're just particular years where those interest rates are, are high enough that today's rates make that make the savings work so overall you can't uh, the the longest maturity in the new bonds that we would be issuing is 12 years because the old bonds the are the current bonds oldest or the 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 old bonds that are being refunded that are due furthest in the future mm -hmm. are due 12 years from now you can't, so you can't use a mechanism like this to extend your debt. create savings to no, extend your debt. We're not right. saving you can't, because we're taking a longer time. Right, you can't it's, turn a, it's the interest rates better. You can't turn a 20 year mortgage into a 30 year mortgage to lower your payment. Thank you. Mike? The additional $40,000 in savings, maybe to you or Jeff, where would that additional savings go? Would we put it in just surplus or that would be um, unexpended funds at the end of fiscal 18 and then it would be the it would be the council's preference mm -hmm. on how that would be treated it okay. would reside in the debt service fund until it lapsed at the end of the year Got it. okay thank you or until we amended change the budget here in a few months right <laughs> it could be used toward the problems created by the new budget. There you go. All right. <coughs> Assuming we get it in time. Okay. We have a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you again, Mike. We have uh, no un unfinished business. We'll move on to other business. Um, 3A. Motion to authorize the town manager to apply for a CTDOT pedestrian signing and pavement marking project. Second. Motion is second. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to ask uh, Derek Gregor, town engineer, to review this with you, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this agenda item tonight is for a pedestrian signing and pavement marking project that is funded by Connecticut DOT. Um, they've sent out a solicitation. Uh, state's been going through municipalities and upgrading pedestrian crossings uh, on state roads with additional signage or pavement markings uh, or a combination of the two um, in an effort to kind of standardize improvements throughout municipalities. They're offering this funding is available uh, to local uh, localities for local roads to do the same type of improvements. Uh, the, the application came out <clears throat> last month. It's due June 30th. Uh, I had spoken with Police department about locations that based on their knowledge of crosswalks and crossing guards and school access routes what they felt were the best locations to consider for for this there is no cost to the town um, only application to go in I don't know they didn't specify what the schedule of getting these funds would be but this the list that you have in your uh, in your packets uh, had a number of locations uh, six locations that PD felt were the most viable uh, for this type of project so we were here tonight just to get authorization from you to allow uh, town manager to apply for funds. Questions about this from, from Derek? So uh, these, these are obviously just markings. There's no 
pavement changes, there's no entrance and egress changes. It's just designed to make it visibly more safe? Yes, it's a, it's a, it could be a combination of pavement markings and or signage that goes up. Town would be responsible for maintaining that, but the initial installations will be done by DOT. Um, it's, it's really to reduce uh, pedestrian fatalities or accidents that occur on local roads. And the police department gave, gave these locations based on, I assume, some form of incidents or yes. historic. Okay, yeah. very good. Other questions? Amy? Um, are these in order of importance or preference? Not specifically. Um, I could talk with PD and see if they had a preference. They gave me the list and we put it in that way. Um, although I don't know that, I guess it would make sense if we were going to do that to prioritize those in case they don't fund all of them and that's only fund a certain amount, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to ask. If you, had, if you knew how many intersections they were funding or if it's based on some kind of a formula? No, the only l information I have at this point is what came uh, in that first letter that's in your packet, and it's, it's a little cryptic. It doesn't give that kind of information, so I don't know, but I, I agree that's a good idea to prioritize those locations in case they do on the short list. Portion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Another question? Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Extensions? Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. B. I'd like to make a motion to authorize the town manager to apply for and accept a State Department of Children and Families grant of $10,000 for assistance to our Juvenile Review Board. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. And I think we have our mm -hmm. staff here. Good evening. Kathy Bagley, Director of Social and Youth Services. And with me is Erica Tixera, the Assistant Director. And Erica has been working on this grant, so I'm going to have her relate with you and give you an update on the grant and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Kath. Good evening. Um, I'm, we're here tonight to um, um, get authorization from um, the town manager to apply and accept um, uh, the grant that provides funds to assist our juvenile review board with um, at-risk youth for the juvenile justice system. Goals of the grant are to standardize juvenile review board practices and enhance and increase services as well as resources available to the youth and their families. And we've had, we've had applied for this grant a couple years now, so this will be, I think, our fourth time applying and award, it would be awarded this grant. So Erica, this is actually administered if it's awarded in your office? Correct, through technically youth services, which is under social services as well. So are these functions currently happening in some form that this would be enhanced or this would be an, a, an additional service for at-risk youth? Um, well, they're currently already taking place because we have the funds right now. We've had them for a couple of years. So they really help us streamline our case management, keep on top of working with families um, and getting them connected to resources within the community to stop reoffending in the future. Any other questions? Mike Bro? Are the uh, state funds, federal funds? They're state from um, Department of Children and Families, and they funnel through um, youth service bureaus. Had they done this before in the past? Yes, this is actually, I think, our fourth time applying for it. Had we ever received the grant? Yes, we have. Okay. Uh, all four times. All four times. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second in front of us. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Thank, Thank you, you, Kathy. And uh, three C. Make a motion to authorize the town manager to execute on behalf of the town of Wethersfield, a public entity established under the laws of the state of Connecticut, an application. Mm -hmm and to file with the Capital Region Council of Governments for the purpose of obtaining financial assistance on the Local Road Accident Reduction Program. Said application shall be made to obtain financial assistance for the roadway reconstruction and installation of safety improvements along approximately 500 feet of Middletown Avenue from the Interstate 91 overpass to the railroad tracks near the town line of the town of Rocky Hill. Second. Thank you. Derek, I know you're going to give us... 
little walk through here. Yep. Hey, my name is, uh, again, my name is Derek Greger, town engineer. Uh, here tonight for this agenda item is uh, seeking approval to apply for a local road accident reduction grant. Um, this is administered by CROG, typically on an annual basis. They'll solicit projects uh, that will help address a road, roadway safety. It's funded by uh, Connecticut DOT. Uh, project limitations are $50,000 to $500,000 in cost. Um, to date, we have uh, completed preliminary design. Uh, we've obtained inland wetlands permit approval. Um, the town council has allocated funds to this project. We had applied for this project uh, last summer. Um, although it was fairly competitive last year, DOT didn't accept as many projects as they normally would, from what I understand from CROG, so we didn't make the cut. Um, since then, we've done some more design, more improvements. We have better, uh, better cost information. What we had allocated thus far to this project was a reduced scope from what we went in for last year with the application. We were just looking at the bare minimum we had to do to try and get this to work and make it a safer condition. Uh, but now we have some better information, and I can update the application we wanted to submit again and see if we have uh, better luck this time around. So I'll just walk you through the project uh, briefly. Now the project's located at the south end of Middletown Avenue um, between I-91 overpass and the Rocky Hill town line. As we discussed earlier, this does overlap with MDC sewer project you heard about earlier this evening. This is the existing conditions plan. Uh, north is to the left. So the left side of the screen is the I-91 overpass. The right side is the Rocky Hill town line and the railroad tracks. Um, at the top of the page is the game club property. What we have out there now is uh, undermining of the road um, for various reasons. What, what's occurred is there's some drainage outfall uh, that comes from the north heading south, the outlet, outlets to the little brook that you see there that's very close to the embankment. Uh, we have an 18-inch culvert that goes underneath the road from the bottom of the sheet to the top of the sheet that is buried in the embankment. Um, in addition to, this is kind of a low point in the road profile, and there's no catch, curbing or catch basin structures to help get that road off the, uh, get that stormwater runoff off the road safely, so it continually washes out and uh, tends to erode the embankment. So what's happened is we've had undermining of the roadway, uh, three cable guide rail, the utility poles that are out there. Back in 2012, the town had gone out and put in temporary, well, put in concrete barriers as a safety measure uh, to, to at least address it temporarily. And it's gotten over the years to the point where even those are starting to become undermined. So we're losing road width and it's becoming more of a hazard. We've, uh, with the roadway being the way it is uh, in the last five years now, we've had a couple of rollover accidents, uh, pedestrian bicycle complaints, so it's a safety concern. And as part of the application, we submit all the accident data we have on file, and they typically want the last three years um, to kind of justify the need for the project. So what you see here in yellow on the top of the top side of the road or the east side of the road there is where the barriers are installed. That's where the, we have the embankment that drops off fairly quickly. Um, just a couple photos of that area. Uh, this is looking southbound uh, towards Rocky Hill. Um, you see the barriers, barriers do make the road fairly narrow in this area. You know, there's a fair amount of traffic that does actually come through here uh, on a daily basis. This is a view looking north uh, along the eastern gutter line towards I-91, as you can see. And this is an old photo uh, from <coughs> last year. You can see the signs falling over. Uh, the, the barriers themselves are starting to be undermined. So it is a, a safety concern. It's something the town does need to address uh, as soon as possible. This plan is a preliminary plan where we are right now uh, as far as uh, layout of what we're looking to do. Um, generally speaking, what we're looking to do is rebuild the embankment off the side of the road. So that would include building, uh, putting curbs, four foot grass shelf, two to one slope down into the wetland area and allow us to put metal beam guide rail uh, running along the side of the road here. That would blend fairly nicely with improvements Rocky Hill had done on the south side of the railroad tracks recently. They redid did a bridge project. They have metal beam rail. It'd be kind of a continuation of the rail that's already out there with the gap being uh, at the railroad track crossing. 
we will be doing as part of that reconstruction, reconstructing a portion of the road to help address the drainage issues that we have out there. We can adjust the road profile a little bit, try and get all the water with some curbing down to a controlled low point. Um, that would be kind of in, in this area at the north end of the wetland area and, and get, it, get it off the road safely. Uh, with that existing 24 inch pipe that takes flow from the highway as well as local roads that currently comes out right into the embankment. We're looking at redirecting it a little further to the east. Uh, as you can see in blue here, we're trying to shift the swale and the flow away from the bottom of the new embankment, as well as extending that existing pipe that currently is buried in the embankment out. Um, so addressing the fact that we'll relocate the 24 inch, extend the 18 inch out beyond the embankment, stabilize the embankment with like an erosion control turf or erosion control matting, and better control the flow coming off uh, the roadway should, should prevent this from occurring uh, in the future. This work does uh, require uh, some work onto the game club property immediately to the east. We have been in touch with the president, uh, Paul O'Keefe. He's a proponent of the project. Um, he'd happy, he's happy to see it uh, go along. This, these improvements do require a couple small easements for drainage extensions that go onto the property. He has seen that. Um, he's okay with that. So depending on, you know, as we move this project forward, whether it be with the local road accident reduction funds or uh, a scaled down version of this project, uh, the game club property is on board and okay with what we're showing for impacts uh, to their particular property. Um, there are some wetlands and floodplain impacts, which we had to get approved through inland wetlands. Uh, there is some grading uh, opposite the channel on the north, on the east side rather of the, uh, the blue that you see, which would be the new swale flow. That's really to help better shape that area and also to uh, provide compensatory storage volume because we are filling into the floodplain as part of this project. Um, we went through this windland wetlands. I mean, technically, this embankment was there at one time and likely there when FEMA flood profiles were developed. However, we, we don't seem to have any really good mapping to show that. So to be conservative, we just said, listen, we got to fill into the floodplain to build the road embankment. We'll do some excavating on the far side within the floodplain to offset any loss in flood storage. And, you know, that was acceptable to them. As, as we stated earlier, uh, and as shown on this plan, MDC does have a sewer line coming through this area. Uh, this area is going to have a combination of the tunneling they had talked about and open cut. We are in negotiations with them based once what they're doing is adjusting the alignment of their pipe. So um, originally they were going to be on the east side of the road digging a fairly large hole right in the embankment. Uh, sounds like with some changes they're looking for to try and have minimal impact, they might be moving that away from the wetlands to the other side of the road. So we're still working, with, that's still in flux as far as what they're going to be doing and how much of this restoration they would have been required to do anyway. Um, you know, clearly I've spoken with them we have a dangerous condition out there now, I wouldn't expect them to come through and then walk away and leave us with that. And they agreed. So there's some portion of this that MDC will be doing. Because at this point, that's still in flux and we haven't really tied down that amount of work or the costs associated with that. For the purpose of this application, we're gonna discuss the fact that MDC is coming through and they are gonna be doing work in this area. But I, I'm gonna kind of disregard the fact that they're gonna be doing some of that um, and put, put that cost just into our project for now, at least for the application to see um, you know, how we come out with that. As I stated, this, this would extend to where Rocky Hill had reconstructed uh, the road on Old Main Street on the south side of uh, the project area here. So this would be kind of an extension of that, as well as, uh, as you, you heard, MDC is going to be going up Middletown Avenue uh, in Mill Street. The town does have plans uh, post their project for those areas that they're not improving. Uh, to come through and do some uh, milling and overlay uh, at, at the end of the project so we can have this, this whole area you know, cleaned up nice when the project's all done. So as I stated earlier, you know, as we're looking for is approval at this point to put in the application. Um, I have spoken to CROG about uh, anything they uh, could offer us and what we can do to improve the application. So it'll be an updated version of what we submitted last year and you know, hope for the best that we can uh, at least get some funds out of this. Uh, worst case, if again, we don't get selected, as I stated, we do have some funds allocated to the project that we uh, will maximize and use as efficiently as possible to at least uh, address the safety concern we have. Does anyone have any questions I could answer? Just, just the timing, Derek, of the MDC piece, because I know obviously you're, you're talking about that and, and you're in discussion now. They, is it generally the timing appropriate, assuming you were to get funded for this, would it work out timing-wise or are you going to have to do some juggling here? We might have to do some juggling because they're starting their project at this location. Um, and they do have a pretty good stretch from here to the treatment plant that's going to take some time. So I haven't seen a real, I haven't really seen a schedule yet. They've given us some very rough numbers. 
my guess is if funds were approved, it would probably be something for next spring at the earliest. So we may have them come through and do some temporary improvements in this area and then follow it up with our project. Um, you know, in the event that we don't, I assume if we get this funding, it would have to go through a full bid process. Right. Um, obviously, the, the contractor that's working out there has expressed interest in doing it for us. So, you know, maybe he'd be competitive because he's already mobilized on site. Otherwise, we would have them fix it to a certain point and then bid out the remaining work. If we did not get the money, then uh, we've been talking with them about, you know, since they're mobilized, we may be able to get some cost reductions with them being on site already. What, what's your current this. estimate on this project if MBC is not involved? If, if they were not involved, we're still working on fine-tuning the numbers. I think last time we put it in, it was around 450000 somewhere in that area. And that includes CROG requires us to put in a 25% contingency, 10% in incidental. So it really inflates the numbers, you know, to a number that doesn't seem reasonable for what we're doing. That's just part of the CROGS mm -hmm. process to be conservative. Right. Um, the reason why we had asked for not to exceed the 500000 is because I'm still kind of working on those numbers to figure out exactly what makes sense. Uh, for this project. I don't want to, you know, at the same time, I don't want to go too high and put too much in and not get selected, but I want to make sure we, if we're going to get this funds, we, we try and do it the right way instead of trying to piecemeal it together with, you know, whatever limited capital we have. Amy. So off of that, it's, um, I see here it says that uh, if the project's selected, the town's responsible for all design, right-of-way costs, and 10% of the contract cost for construction. Um, and then I see towns allocated 100,000 in CIP funds for the project. So, does the 100,000 would that cover the design right away and 10% of the contract cost? The design's done. We've done it in house, okay. um, so that's all set. Mm -hmm. uh, if if we were at the $500,000 threshold, we would owe 50,000, and the the limited right away or drainage easements we would need for the project would be minimal. So yes, okay. that that I feel that money would cover. Thank you. Yeah. Mike Rowe. A couple of years back when Rocky Hill did the, the bridge right there, do we know how much that cost the, just the town of Rocky Hill by any chance? I, do, I don't have numbers on what that project cost them. The state funded a portion of that bridge replacement, if I'm not mistaken, though, correct? That might be. It was before my time, to be oh, honest with okay. you. I don't, I don't know what the specifics of that project were. <clears throat> Would there be any state funding possibly available for this stretch uh, just north of that? Uh, north of their project in our yeah. project area? Well, these are DOT state funds for through this application. Just they would go through CROG. They go, yeah, CROG administers it, so they do the solicitation. They do the preliminary evaluation of projects. Then they make they recommend projects to DOT, and then they do their final assessment on who's going to get the funds. It is a, a officially state money, although CROG is the administrator of uh, the program. Okay. Thank you. Is there any requirement that you have to use the funds? Assume we get it. Is there a timeline that you have to start the project? I don't want to be caught in a... You know, that's... Uh, I, I think our, our, our timeline to follow MDC is well within... I, I don't know the, uh, exactly that number or what that time... I'm sure there is. Um, they want the money. They typically want to use the money as quickly as they can. So um, I suspect if it was next year's project... The funds may not even be really available until next construction season anyway, so I, I don't see a problem with okay. getting this done uh, after MDC comes through. Particularly because, I mean, I'd be a little more concerned if they were starting at the other end and they were going to be here two years from now, then we'd, I'd really have to look into that. But being that they're starting in this area, I don't, I don't see any issue with that. Okay. <coughs> and, um, Derek, you had mentioned, I think, that there's still some temporary shoring up that's happening, you know, as we, this year as well, regardless of this. And is that funded and covered and you have a plan for that it's not yeah. obviously not as extensive but yes and that will that that too will also follow mdc's project so um, assuming that they're probably moving out of this area this year we would try and use the money that we have available to at least to do the minimum the minimum meant that you know maybe instead of putting in some catch basins at the low point and piping it out which would be, would be ideal maybe we just got to do some leak offs um, or possibly uh, maybe instead of such extensive road reconstruction in this area, we just reconstruct the portion of the road that's right along there and come back later and do a mill and overlay, you know, once MDC's out when we do the rest of the work. So I, I, I feel between MDC's contribution as far as what they have to do and our scaled back scope that we, when we talked with CIP, we were pretty close to what we felt we needed. We may be a little bit short, but we were going to kind of evaluate that once we had better information from MDC. One follow-up. The uh, so the sign that was in that picture, has that been? Is it that way now, or has it been fixed? 
So you know, this was last year's picture, so honestly, I don't remember it. Um, <laughs> it may be like that now. Um, can we have someone go out? Yeah, we certainly can. Yeah, and and take care of that? Yeah, I see it's uh, in this photo. It was summertime, so yeah, it, was, it may have been fixed, but I can check on that. Okay. I mean, that's kind of telltale of how everything is just yeah. going to the east. Yeah, it's, it's hard to see because of all the vegetation here, but the guide rail you see at the bottom, that three cable rail, um, a, as you get further to the north, is just, it's just gone. It's really not there anymore. It's, it just has sunk so much over the years. Thank you, Derek. Well, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. And we have two bids this evening, 4 eight. Motion to accept the bid from Calvert Safe and Lock, including alternate number one for $49,448. Second. Mm. Motion is second. I think Mr. Bushy is here this evening for any questions on this bid. Mm. Good evening. Hi, Fred. Uh, before you have uh, bid number 2017-9 uh, for the replacement of the doors at the uh, doors and related hardware at Charles Wright and uh, two doors at the Hamner Elementary School. Uh, Calvert Safe and Lock was the uh, apparent low bidder at $49,448. Um, I uh, vetted these folks out through uh, uh, the uh, uh, the recommendations that they've had, plus I've talked to uh, some folks that uh, have used um, these folks in the past here through uh, uh, our Connected Buildings and Grounds Association, and uh, they seem to be a very good vendor, so I'd like to bring these folks forward. Questions for Fred on this? Uh, Amy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't care. You want to go? Go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering about the time of completion. It says 120 days, but would this work be completed during the summer when building is empty? Most it's should be able to be to be done during the summer. There's probably about a four. There is a four or six week lead time to get uh, materials. Uh, I've I've spoken to uh, uh, their uh, uh, their CEO. Uh, actually, this morning about this, he was out to measure do some final measurement of. Uh, uh, of the openings and uh, he seems confident that he can get these parts within let's say five weeks or so and get them installed before school actually starts so I don't think there'll be any any intrusion on uh, you know, on, on the school day and then the other question was um, does this complete the project at these two schools or this, where does it bring us this this, this completes both um, uh, the Emerson Williams school which is it, it, I'll just Bring you up to speed here, Emerson Williams and Charles Wright, as far as uh, uh, doors and hardware. I, I've done a couple of doors that were needed at the Hanmer School. And if I were to move forward with any other doors and hardware, which I do think is is, is still um, uh, still up as far as uh, uh, top priority, as far as security is concerned, I would move to Highcrest School. But then again, uh, I. We've had ongoing talks with our facility committee within the Board of Education on how they want to move forward on uh, uh, renovations of other schools. I don't want to duplicate my efforts here if, I, if, if we're going to bring forward a school that's going to be renovated here within the next few years. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen, but the talks, you know, surely we have to have these talks now. So I'd like to have, uh, 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 before I bring anything else forward, I'd like to hear from uh, our committee at hand to see where where they are and what they think about moving this forward doors in uh, doors and how outside doors and hardware are kind of a little bit of a pet peeve of mine especially in, in, in at high crest where there's a lot of outside doors to each individual classroom so uh, that's where I, I would move next if if it dictates that uh, you know to move forward like that okay but Charles Wright will be completed Charles Wright would round. be completed as far as uh, uh, yeah Yes. And then Hamner, these are just the replacement of doors, some doors that are necessary at this time, but not a complete. That's correct. For that building. That's okay, correct. Thank you. 
So, uh, Fred, just I know you had in there some notation about no substitutes, and then the, the specification sheet is referring to specific types. Is that a, a matching type with existing hardware that replaced at other schools? That's a match what we have existing, uh, Mr. Montanari, within, uh, within the Wethersfield High School now, within uh, um, Emerson Williams, within uh, it will be Charles Wright. It's all a uh, uh, very good, solid brand that uh, I think is, is, is needed within our, with, within our buildings. Um, we can carry one line of parts instead of having to carry multiples in our trucks for any repairs that have to be done. So the system is sort of unified if you have to replace a key core or something. It's That's correct. One, okay. one could be used from the other. I could take from one and use from another if, I, if, if need be. Um, just, it seems to me four or five years ago, I thought all the grammar schools had upgrades to the locks and the doors. Uh, following Sandy Hook, there was not. No, sir. That's when we actually started, Mr. Berry, um, okay, on, I, you know, on this quest to kind of move forward with this. Um, uh, we replaced some door cylinders, but nothing uh, 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 hardware-wise. Uh, or door wise most of the doors that we have uh, exterior doors in uh, in our elementary schools are all full glass doors and I'm trying to get away from that full glass scenario where you put uh, uh, you'd have a uh, um, you have a style in the middle of the door for smaller pieces of glass uh, uh, within so you you could just see out instead of a full pane of glass uh, and that's something we I started to do maybe five years ago four or five years ago but no that wasn't it, it's not it it's it's something that we've started kind of uh, uh after sandy hook i had a little bit going on before that with doors that were uh, actually falling apart that you know needed to be replaced but uh, we got a little bit more aggressive when uh, when this happened other questions Go ahead. hi fred um, how many bids were actually submitted? Um, four. And what was the cost spread between this particular right, one? Cost and spread. We have we have between uh, the uh, uh, the recommended vendor at, at uh, here. The bid was put out because I wasn't sure if I have enough funding to complete what I wanted to complete. So what I did is I put five sets of do five double doors out at Charles Wright and the two at Hamner as a base bid and I put five as an alternate. So there was two figures that came in. And and going from low bid to high bid, we had uh, for the two, uh, for lump sum cost for the, uh, uh, the vendor that I'm bringing forward here was uh, 49,448 as compared to uh, um, a local vendor here in Rocky Hill at uh, 68,970. But there was quite a swing in between. So the 49,448 is for the Derby Company? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm just doing some quick math. So that's the lump sum cost plus alternate one. Yep. And if you. Even if you were to take the uh, our local bid, uh, our local bidding preference at 10% uh, to knock that down, if we went to the second, which was uh, 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 Connecticut Carpentry, in, on, uh, who was located on the Salestine Highway, but in Rocky Hill, uh, even knocking that uh, uh, that firm down 10% brought them down to 59029, which is still $10,000 above what uh, Coward Safe and Lock has brought forward. And they have met all the intention of the spec that uh, I brought forward. And kind of a, I guess, tangentially similar to what um, Paul was asking, the scope being so narrowly defined, you're saying it helps with what we have currently working on other doors, other That's hardware? That's correct. I'm just curious, why just one product? Could there be others that are better, others that are similar? 
Good solid products, number one. Um, door, uh, door closers that are guaranteed for 20 years. Guaranteed. That I get absolutely through the factory, through a Legion Corporation. Uh, uh, lock mechanisms, guaranteed 10 years that I get through a Legion Corporation. Uh, panic hardware. Von Duprin products, guaranteed for 30 years. So 20 years down the road here, if, if we have a, a piece of panic hardware that needs to be replaced, this gets replaced uh, at, uh, it may cost us the labor portion of that, but the, the panic bar itself uh, uh, will be at no cost to us. And there's no other brand that offers those kind of warranties? Not that type of warranty, no. Not, not that I've experienced here in, 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 in my tenure. Do you have any independent reviews of this product? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've had I, many, different, many different areas, many different folks that have used this, uh, excuse me, used this product right along the line uh, and with absolutely no problems, uh, no warranty problems. Is that something that you could produce for the council so that we could look at it? I can get you something, yes. That would be helpful. Thank you. Tony? Uh, two things, Fred. Uh, number one, uh, by using the same product in all the all schools, this will also eliminate the number of various master keys your tradespeople have to carry from school to school? That's, that's one of my intentions, uh, Mr. Martino. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And... Uh, the other is based on the funding you're using here. I know in the past you've had some general fund money as well as capital money and some grant money. Uh, once you spent this money, what is left in your various accounts to do future doors? Is it wiped out, or do you still have funds left over? Uh, this this would bring this to I I, I believe that uh, we had about fifty three thousand dollars and change left in CIP. This at at forty nine would bring us pretty close to what what we've had left for that uh, if if I were to move forward with anything else obviously I'd be asking for probably for high crash school or again as I just explained I would wait until and see what uh, uh, facilities committee would like to bring forward if you know a, are we gonna put another school out there we're gonna try to do that you know what's what's you know what's the goal of the board uh, uh, moving forward here uh, I wouldn't want to entertain something um, a project such as this, if we're going to, uh, uh, for instance, Hamner School, if if that's the next school to, go, to be raised and, and we put something else, I wouldn't want to put the funding into that building. I'd rather put it into one of our other buildings here to enhance those. Thank you. Uh, just another follow-up, Fred, on this, because I, I, normally speaking, when we see bids for product line, we don't see a particular product name or variation like this von duprin is a specific do i'm just curious like just to dumb it down a little bit that particular identification with no substitutions locks in uh, yeah, obviously there's at least four bidders that use that product obviously that's available or it, like these four companies would it be likely they would have six different types of locking and panic bar mechanisms, but this one is one manufacturer that you like and know has good credibility, and you're using. This has got a, this manufacturer is is it's actually four different manufacturers for the products that we're using, uh, uh, Paul. Within yep. within the scope of the job, uh, they're all backed by the the Allegiant Corporation, and they're all backed by the uh, uh, extensive warranty that they offer. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do here is uh, get the best sort of warranty for the district that I possibly can get. Yeah, I'm just following up a little bit what Jody was saying too, because four bid, but there were eight that took the bid. And I assume because that specific substitution option was not offered, I'm just, again, rhetorically wondering how we know that the four that didn't bid don't have a suitable product but couldn't bid because they don't have that product. I, I can't answer that. Okay. It, but it is a little bit unusual to direct a bidder to a specific manufacturer. Um, I've been successful in the past with that. Okay. 
and I'm trying to use my success as, as, my, uh, uh, as my goal moving forward. Uh, just one follow-up on the so you're only putting two doors in at Hamner School because yes. of uh, possible renovations there. Well, the do both doors are kind of falling apart as we speak. Um, we're going to try to get the. I, um, when I did find out we had th these monies left, we added those two doors to the uh, uh, to the mix of the of uh, uh, what was left at Charles Wright. Well, you didn't want to do any other doors there because no. of potential renovations. That it could be, I'm just saying potential. Okay, thanks. Other questions, Mike? Thanks, Fred. We've completed or you've completed the door replacement at Emerson already? Correct. Was that done through, did we use Calvert? We did not use Calvert. But we did use the hardware that we're specking in that this. is correct and two two separate contractors did that uh did that building uh mr l okay and according to you we've had success with that hardware absolutely okay is the hardware it, going off of what paul was saying is the hardware is it produced here in connecticut or no, okay. no it's not and then it is it part of a uh um you know, I know a lot of school construction grants have to follow certain criteria. Is it a well-known, nationally known, reputable? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. This is actually what we used at uh, Wethersfield High School. Oh, okay. So this is the hardware was used at Wethersfield High School yes. under the new construction. Yes. Silas Dean Middle School. Silas Dean Middle School. I had no play in what happened at Silas Dean Middle School. That was before my time, Mr. Earl. Okay. I, can't, uh, and, I, but I can't really talk to that. Weathersfield High School, Emerson, and then to Tony's point, it would match up with all. That, that is correct. Okay. Other questions? So, um, Fred, I asked those questions because there was a concern raised about the limit of this spec uh, mm -hmm. raised. And um, I think I, I connected with you a little bit earlier about this just to raise the question to educate myself. Mm -hmm. This is outside my skill set of knowledge, but um, I still have some uneasiness about the lock in to this one manufacturer. And, you know, I certainly trust your judgment. This is your skill set, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to defer to you on it. Um, but. I am. It's. A, it's. I don't remember too many bids where the manufacturer was identified in advance, and I imagine that's probably true on a lot of products. That if you identify a manufacturer, there's multiple bidders that could bid. But I'm left wondering, based on that inquiry uh, by a local company that could not bid on this uh, because of that specific specification, no substitute. If if in fact there are other options, I, I, and I'm not. I'm not qualified to make that judgment, of course, because mm -hmm. you know you're really in a far better position. And I, I understand your argument about it, but I, I'm just wondering about that. It's leaving me just a little bit of a question in my mind about it. I don't know that it, it's earth shaking, but I'm, I, I still have that concern. Anything else? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 Okay, we better do a count here. <laughs> um, we just do a hand count. Uh, all in favor? I'm not in favor. I'm just asking to raise hands. One, two, three, four. And I, and I was going to abstain because I had the discussion with one of the vendors, so I don't know if I can vote on this. Well, if you abstain, then it's three to four. Three to, yeah, three to four. It passes. Oh, okay. I mean, I think, I, I think have I, to check with the town attorney to see if how that works. Okay. Because I was planning to abstain because of that conversation. I don't think I'm qualified to make a judgment on this. So four in favor, three opposed, one abstain is the formal vote. We'll just check. We'll check with the town attorney on that. Okay. And we'll get back. You all three voted no? Correct. Okay. We'll check. Okay. We'll check. Thank you. Thank you, Fred.
Okay, 4B is our last item of the night. Motion to authorize the town man manager to enter into a master lease agreement with TD Equipment Finance for the financing of the Catone Field Turf Replacement Project. Second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, Mike O'Neill is here this evening to answer specific questions regarding the financing bid. But on the podium this evening, there's a map. Uh, it's got some green lines on it. As you know, part of the um, <coughs> alternate was to add some fencing and some gates that we didn't have numbers on at the last meeting. So uh, we kind of sketched out how many feet of uh, fence and gate we need. Um, it adds up to about 715 feet of fence and some gates, which adds somewhere between twenty dollars to $25,000 to the project. Um, and then I'm giving you a spreadsheet that shows with all the ads and the alternates and the fencing it comes up to about 1,156,000. So what we would propose is under the lease agreement authorize up to 1,160,000 uh, at the low bidder of 1.85%. And then when we get the specifics on the quantities, we'll, uh, we'll use that number. So Mike's here to talk about the bids. Good evening, Mike O'Neill, Finance Director. My office uh, issued a solicitation for bids for this financing. Back at the beginning of the month, uh, we received three responses. Um, the low, res the low uh, interest rate was, as the town manager said, 1.85%, which over seven years um, equates to approximately $70,000 of interest cost. And the next uh, lowest response was 2.11% and the total interest cost at that rate was 80, is $86,000. The last respondent was 2.4%, uh, $91,000 of interest cost for the seven years. <clears throat> Questions about this for Mike? Easy, straightforward. Um, and the fence is included in this cost, right? Yes. We would ask that someone add one million one hundred sixty thousand dollars, not to exceed in the financing amount at the end of that motion. Okay. Perfect. All right. Do we have to add that word in right now? Mike, uh, quickly, I think <laughs> in one of the first. Um, meetings we had about this uh, new field and the possibility of fencing um, and just semantics is it black fencing or it's the, black it is black fencing is there any matching existing fencing that goes around to tie it in or no the uh, the existing fencing that runs along the west side is well it's black because it well it's brown <laughs> <laughs> this will look significantly Rust. newer than the, the existing fencing on the exterior of the Katona. Okay. Yeah. And then would this, is this fencing for security purposes or is it for aesthetic purposes? Uh, currently we use a uh, golden rope around the field yeah. to keep people off the field during events. The athletic director asked that the fencing, this fencing be part of the project to basically keep people off the field during events Got it. as a more formal way to do it in in uh, permanent way to do it keeping the kids from rolling down the hill at the concession stand to the end zone perhaps yep that's about that happened and that i've seen it i mean it there's obviously there's a liability as well yeah. um pretty steep know, hill steep hill going down as well as you know people coming in and getting onto the field um and you know disrupting how high is this fence going to be, Jeff? Four feet. Okay. So you can see over it, obviously. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's at the field level? Yes. So it's not up the hill. It's at the bottom of the hill? It was just where it is on the map. At the end zone. Basically outside the safety zone of the end zones and the safety zone of the field itself. Basically where the golden rope is now. Yeah. It's just up. Or the yellow rope or... And three gates, one will be, you know, each at the corners and one 
on the uh, north end. If this gets approved, where are we with the project? Um, they are ready to go. They started submittals to Luke McCoy at uh, the uh, architect's office. They want to. They want to be in. They want to be well underway by July seventh. And is there? I don't anticipate this. It sounds like we're ready to go. But is there any way the council, if there's anything that would potentially delay this getting done? We don't foresee anything now, but if there is, we would reach out to you all. Weather is really <laughs> going to be the only player in the game. We had a pre-construction meeting with the vendor last week. He is putting his submittals in. He would prefer to be on the field as soon as possible. Okay, good. To get done. And now when we say that the playing surface will be ready on the 11th of August, but some of these, you know, fencing and netting things, like the nets between the field, the nets on the on the baseball field, those won't be done. But the surface will be in and certified for playing on August 11th. But there may be punch list items after that. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Aye. Opposed. Thank that you. includes 1.16 million. Oh yes, and the, the way do we, we let make a motion, please, um, to not to exceed, not to exceed, <laughs> the original author that you speak, right? Yep. Uh, motion to authorize the town manager to enter into a master lease agreement with TD Equipment Finance for the financing of the Catone Field turf re replacement project in an amount not to exceed one million one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So that's a friendly amendment. We should just vote on that. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And just the meeting minutes of um, June 5th. I make a motion. <coughs> so I have a second. Second. Any changes, deletions? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Abstain. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Oh, no, no. public comment. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry out there. Didn't mean to jump the gun. Ooh. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be received poorly, I'm sure. Yes. Public comment. I'm sorry. Bob, I assume you're coming back up. Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Tonight, maybe I missed something, but uh, Kathy Bagley was up here with a young lady talking about a grant where uh, they were gonna, had something to do with reaching out and connecting people with services. I didn't really understand what that group was, but it was Parks and Rec. But then on the other hand, I heard in the past this Weathersfield Collaborative does the same thing. Reaches out, helps people, blah, 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 blah. But we're funding both of these. Why do we have, why do we have duplication? Duplication we don't need. That's expensive, Mayor. I think you should consider eliminating one. Also, the, 2000, uh, the 2017 Local Road Accident Reduction Program. I tell you, we shouldn't have any roads. That are, that are prone to accidents. With the money that we spend here in this town, you know, this is local road accident reduction program. Why do we need a program? All of our roads should be in darn good shape. Yeah, I, I, I know that section of road and I, I think it's pretty poor. But with all the money that we've spent uh, and we've just let it go, let it go, let it go, and we take on new initiatives. Typical. It's, it's terrible. I was up here earlier, and I couldn't find what I wanted to say or highlight. And what I did find was that uh, we have a recreation fund that I think you should use to fund the Catone turf. Recreation fund, you have $680,000 in there. 
You have the Community Development Fund. That's appropriate too, with 19,000, almost 20,000. You have parks program, and I'm staying within the parks, within this, I don't know about the development one, but uh, uh, the parks, the youth, and uh, one of them's got 18,000. The social and uh, uh, youth services has 572,000. You have social and youth services, another one. Maybe that's the same amount of money. Yes, it is. But you would, between that, be able to fund it without financing. And you'd be using at least money that's, that's tied into recreation, which is what Cotone Field is. And you'd leave an IOU back there for them. Or someday you'll pay them back. But in the meantime, forget the, the financing. You've got the money, and you should utilize it. Any, any sensible person would, would go along with that, at least uh, those that I've spoken to. Um, I did mention also, next subject, and uh, I gotta find it here for a second. I mentioned that I had gone through the uh, escrow account to some degree. I haven't gone through it entirely, but I'm going to. And this is, this is an off-the-ledger account. This is an account that has a tremendous amount of activity and is not part of the Board of Education, yet it's serviced by the Board of Education. They work with it, they control it, but it's not on their books when they come before the town council with their budget. It's off book. And I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong with the kinds of monies that they're spending in this particular account. I mean, I see oodles, eight, 10 different restaurants. Remember I was up here a month ago, two months ago, rattling off some numbers with different restaurants in town. These are, there's several of the same and they're spending big buckaroos. They're the same restaurants as well as other restaurants. And this is not even authorized. None of this is authorized. I don't know who in the world signs off on I know who signs the checks, but who in the world controls it? <coughs> it's a tremendous amount of money. I see in organizations, uh, there's printing companies that they utilize. This is for a student escrow account. We see a barn door company for 45, 2,000, 2,500 bucks. They must have built a, bought a barn, maybe to store things. An escrow account? I don't think that's appropriate. They have business cards. Business cards for who? $1,300 for business cards that they charged off on. They have a number of buses, a number of buses, Durham, Daco, Premium, that they're, that they're renting, that is not part of our budget for the Board of Education. These items should be over in the budget. And when they're doing their actuals, when they're providing the actuals for you, Mayor, those expenditures should be in there. It's appropriate and it's accounting. What you have now is a mishmash of garbage. You're not following the rules. And this has been going on for years. We pay a superintendent what we're paying him. You know what we're paying him. He's in charge of this account. This account that has a lot of money coming and going. And it's damn poor accounting that he's doing. And he's educating children to become accountants and to become professionals. And I don't really want to knock Mike down, but we have had other superintendents too, I'm sure, that led the way into this mess. 
course, Mike's been there eight years now. Maybe he should have cleaned it up. But I really believe that when we start looking at these types of costs, I see Apple Computer. They bought Apple Computers with, with um, escrow money. 1300 bucks, 1400 bucks, one shot, and another 1300 bucks, another shot. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem right, Mayor. It belongs on their books. And at the end of the day, they would tell us how much they actually spent. They don't include this. They falsify their statements. Now, it could be every darn school system in the state of Connecticut does it. And maybe that explains why Connecticut is Connecticut today. Bankrupt, heading down. There's no other way. I mean, I see a number, I see a, a, a number of entries, checks given to the same person. Who's an administrator at the school? Thank you, Bob. And you know, Mayor? Yeah, thank you, Bob. What are you going to do about it? Thank you, Bob. You're thank you, Bob. You're not going to do anything about it. And that's just how it is in, in the town of Wethersfield. We do nothing about your problems. You know what they are now, Mayor. You can't say other, otherwise. You have accounting problems. Thank you very much, and I don't know what you're, and I know your auditors, from what I understand, don't even audit this account. So what you're paying them, <coughs> kiss it all goodbye. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to speak? Um. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just being advised on the lock thing. We need five votes to pass that lock appropriation. So we have four with an abstain. So we should probably introduce a motion to table. Can we do that if we've already voted? Well, I think we can. I think we can. What? Well, the introducer of the motion can. Uh, I think you can introduce in the same meeting a motion to reconsider, but it's got to come from the favorable side, even though we don't, we need five votes, which we don't have. So we can get a motion to reconsider. They made that motion. Do we oh. need five votes to make that motion? Oh, we, we could probably get that, so. Yeah, I think we can get five votes to, to get a motion to reconsider. Uh, make a motion to I mean, reconsider. You guys are on the other side, so I just to make sure we're doing this right, because it's kind of unusual. Yeah, you talked me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you talked me out of it. Out of what? Out of voting, voting for it. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, and, and, and again, I mean, we can, let, let's get a motion to reconsider and just have a discussion right. for a minute. Can Make I, a motion to reconsider the locks motion. Okay, can I get a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, and so just for brief discussion, I abstained because a vendor that was locked out approached me and spoke with me, so I felt that I probably should vote. But I mean, that's not really a conflict, but I, you know, I just think I, I followed the same channel of thinking that Jody had, and, I, and my concern was when we were doing it that we, we should look at that topic of that lock in to a spec with no exchanges, limited the number of vendors, and perhaps, again, to Jody's point, uh, might have prevented us from getting a like or better quality for less when you, you know, with so many vendors that came. So, um, Right now, as we sit today, we don't have an appropriation on that. So we have to either ask for uh, to go back out to bid, or uh, if we want to wait to the next council meeting when we have 10 to see if we get five votes. But you know, I kind of feel like we. Well, Paul, if we wait until next time, maybe we can ask Mr. Bushy if these specific locks and things he's asking for any contractor can obtain through a wholesaler, the same wholesaler. It's not locked in where it's, you know, locked into one or two distributors. If that's the case, then these other, you know, other contractors just didn't, you know, do their homework to get a price from them or just wanted to use what they were familiar with. Yeah. That I mean, might help sway, you yeah. know, somebody's I mean, decision. I think, I think Jeff can communicate back to Mr. Bushy that there is a concern about this bid spec being that narrow. 
and that there is at least one vendor who has raised the question that I'm aware of that is saying a light quality or better can be offered if it's not narrowly written that way. So I think, I don't know how urgent it is to get this lock package done for Charles Wright, but even if he goes back out and has discussion with the vendors that came who could not submit because of that spec, I think he could at least examine them submitting like material and getting some pricing and revisit it. Well, it's a closed bid. It's a formal bid process, so, so it's open. he'd have to reopen it. He'd have to redo the bid process. Using hardware he yeah. isn't familiar with. Yeah, I mean I again, as I said in the public discussion, I'm not skilled enough to answer whether Fred's position on this is, you know, justified or not, but it seems to me when you have four bidders and you had eight or ten and at least one is expressing concern that with that tight a spec. I mean, most of the time when we get specs for a bid, it's not directing the bidders to a manufacturer. You know, it can be piping and lighting, fixtures like the pool. It's like, oh, we're going to have, uh, you know, Crest Mechanical lights. Okay, that limits it down or, you know, whatever. And, and so I understand Fred's point, and, he, and maybe if he can make a more compelling argument if, we, if the others are offered. But seeing as I think there is a question about this that has been raised, and um, it's, it's leaving me uneasy that we have, in fact, locked this bid in too tight based on what, you know, was at least exchanged. Now, that may not be the case, but um, so at the end of the day, what I'm thinking is we need to direct Fred back to revisit this. Is that your counsel, Jeff? Because I need some direction on this. It's kind of unusual. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Paul, could we ask him to approach the vendors that did not bid and ask why they did not bid? Is that an appropriate thing yeah, to do? I mean, do? I, I think the answer is going to be they don't use that product. But they, at least one that I'm aware of that approached said, mm -hmm. my product is better, it's less expensive, and I'm being locked out because I'm not allowed to try to substitute. The, the, the point I would probably say to Fred is um, allow the substitute and examine it. You know, if, if somebody comes in with a substitute lock and you examine it and you say, it's inferior, Let me, you know, come and do your dog and pony show, show it to me, I can put it next to the other one, and you can verify that this can be done, then at least, but if it, then his argument prevails that I looked at it and it's not substitutable to the other, you know, we're going to be carrying extra keys, the cores can't be swapped, you know, but at least if you've, if you've allowed somebody to present it, mm -hmm. I think we have a better chance to say we've examined it properly. So why don't we ask those questions next time rather than reject table this rather than rejecting it at this point table it because you've got it on the table to reconsider ask Fred those questions about the inner operability of these different locks if they truly are night and day or 180 degree distance and not compatible with one another and he has selected this based upon the quality in his record there are four vendors that can provide this, this yeah. system. Okay. So I think we need to find out, you know, is it truly an inoperable system where, you know, they can't work together? Okay. I so think, let's, I and there's to, Silas Dean too. I think to Tony's point though, we should also Doesn't find really out if these it. vendors can provide it, but are, don't want to. Yeah, well, I, I think that's or fine. Or they're not registered with that distributor. Right, right. Yeah, that might be a locked in kind of thing. So, right, so you're, we should have a motion to table. Motion to table. Okay. Let motion. me entertain a motion to table. Motion to table. Can second. I get a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. And so you'll direct that back. I will. Okay. Now, our next meeting's not till third week of July. I, I, I don't think there's urgency on this, to be honest. It's not like the field or okay. one of the other projects. I think, you know, I mean, frankly, a lot of these projects to get approved, they don't get started for months anyway, so. I think it'd be better to answer this question. We do want, though, just to that point, we do want as much of it done during the summer months yep. as possible. So, well, I mean, I think Fred can get on it because you're going to communicate that to him, and if need be, if he wants to have a special meeting, because it's that time sensitive, then we can try to get a special meeting. Jeff, if you go back to the notes or the minutes of the meeting, I had asked him for a specific thing. Yeah, you wanted warranty information. An independent product review. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If he could provide that, we could all read it, come to the next meeting with verifiable questions. I think that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody cool on that? Mm -hmm. Yep, I have that all right. down. All right, <coughs> I can entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Any questions?